Hello and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that will soon be attending an institution that was also attended by Don Henley and Roy Orbison. But they never graduated. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at a World War II era game called Fog of War from Stronghold Games. In Fog of War from Stronghold Games, two players that take on the roles of the Axis powers or the Allies during World War II. And now, what is going to happen is this is not a conventional war game. It's not a game of lines on a map per se. Rather, it is a game of kind of the intelligence and trying to outbluff and outwit uh, your enemy, kind of from the operational standpoint in World War II. Now, in a nutshell, here's how it plays. Essentially, you have uh, cards uh, that uh, are kind of the locations around the board. It almost looks like a Monopoly board where we've got all the locations around the board that correspond to locations on the map uh, in, in Europe and, and, and uh, thereabouts. Now, the game uh, is also going to have uh, cards that have represent kind of military units, either land, air, or sea. Air can be used for land or sea, but you've got you know, the boats or the tanks or the airplanes. And they've got numbers on them indicating their strength. You've got a number of these cards. The Axis kind of starts out stronger as the game goes on. The Allies get stronger. Now, what's going to happen is you are going to get kind of your home areas that you start with. And you can place these strength cards underneath the, or rather on the locations around the board, indicating where they are on the actual board. So people can know, okay, they've got cards there. But some of these cards may be bluffs. They may be uh, things that... that you know, are not really strength at all. In fact, you could place a, a uh, naval strength in a land territory, in which case it's just a bluff card. It doesn't count for anything and vice versa. Now, the heart of the game revolves around these uh, kind of operational boards. They look like kind of spinners. And what it is is you've got uh, places to place different cards around the, the, the center. What you do is you, you essentially you're trying to find out where you want to attack. You place a location card of where you want your armies to go and then put a number of strengths under them. You then rotate the the uh, thing on your next turn. So you're going to be filling this up with different locations to attack and different strengths for each operation you're attempting to undertake. Now on your turn there are different actions you can take. You can add cards to existing operations on your kind of operations wheel board or you can put them to defend areas around the board as well. You can also add cards to any kind of quagmires. These are ongoing battles uh, that are going on and you can also take some intelligence tokens that are going to be useful in the game as well. But critically, you can also cancel operations or launch operations. Now, you can't launch an operation you've just placed. And you have to kind of wait a little while, a couple of turns. And also, too, when it starts initially, it's going to be weaker because you haven't had the time to develop it. If the operation's been there a while, you can actually launch it with a little bit of a, an advantage, a plus one advantage. Uh, you're going to go ahead and, uh, let's say, you launch an, an attack. Well, what you do is you reveal what your cards are, your enemy reveals what his cards are, and you're looking for who has the greatest strength number. Now, if you can effectively double the uh, strength number of your opponent, you win. If it's less than that, it becomes a quagmire, an ongoing battle that will continue uh, into the next turn. Now, there's some various... Um, Things that happen during during battle, uh, you know, you're, you're going to place your cards on your kind of little card holder uh, to to see, you know, whether you win or lose, and your your cards are going to be kind of separated depending on how that played out. And then what you're going to do is toward the end of your turn, after you've done all your uh, actions that you want to do, you have your intelligence round. Now during your intelligence round, you can spend tokens to essentially look at your enemy's cards, either on the board or off of his operations wheel. But you can't look at all of them. You can only look at a certain number, and the 
the person whose cards you're looking at kind of gets to shuffle them. He shows you, then he goes back and he shuffles them again, so he doesn't know which cards you've seen. And so that can be kind of interesting. But he can also spend intelligence tokens to try to prevent you from looking at any of his cards. But when that happens, he may not see any strength, but he may see where you're planning to attack. Or he may not know where you're going to attack, but he may see that you're coming in strength. And so, or, or you're bluffing. So there's a lot of different components there to this, this back and forth with intelligence tokens. You can spend intelligence tokens earlier before you place your operations, but when you do that, it costs a lot more. Now, once you've exhausted all of your cards from your draw pile, you essentially end the game year, and you go through, you do some housekeeping, you kind of clean up your cards, you can add the next uh, calendar year cards to your deck, or you know, to one of your decks that you can then buy cards from. You also have uh, kind of resources on the board, production, uh, that let you, of course, again, buy cards, buy more intelligence tokens, do those sorts of things at that time. But you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, uh, trying to learn each other's intentions. You're attacking, and you're trying to prevent your enemy from knowing what you're doing, even as you're trying to attack him. Uh, at the end of every year, the Axis player is going to look at um, how many points he has. He's going to be essentially getting points for everything he controls. It kind of adds and adds and adds and accumulates. And if at the end of any year he's got more than 70 points, then the Axis player wins the game. Now, the, uh, he, there's, there's even an option where he can buy points, so that can be kind of an interesting way to get to victory. Now, if Berlin and the Ruhr are both occupied by the Allied player, then the Allies win the game. Also, too, there's another important victory condition. If by the end of 1944 the other victory conditions have not yet triggered, then what happens is the Axis player, who at the beginning of the game selected two specific victory countries, there's about, I think, six or eight or so that he chooses potentially from, you know, Italy, Poland, etc., etc., um, he selects two of these cards. Now, at the end of 1944, if he still controls those two provinces, he wins the game. If the Allies control at least one of those, the Allies win Fog of War. So this is a game that had been on my radar for a while, it looked just phenomenal, um, the idea of the intelligence aspect of war. This is from Ang the, the uh, Jeff Engelstein, who did uh, uh, the Space Cadets game, I believe. And this, to me, just... Uh, and I've not played the Space Cadets games. I've always wanted to, but I never have. Um, but this game, to me, just looked amazing. As many of you know, I'm a World War II historian. I'm actually going to be starting my Ph.D. in, in World War II. Um, dealing with World War II here uh, in a few months. And I'm super excited about it. I love World War II, that, that history. And the idea of the intelligence side of the war, which is something that has not effectively been tackled as kind of the basis for a game in and of itself, is a phenomenal theme. A phenomenal theme. And I'm so excited to see that aspect of the war get this kind of love. And it, it, it was brilliant. Now... With regard to how the game plays with the with the operations wheels and then the, the defending the, the, the places on the board, this too is just an amazing mechanic. It is amazing. In a weird way, it kind of reminds me of Twilight Struggle, how you're kind of battling back and forth for specific areas without really... It's where, I mean, in this one, you don't have all the information. In, in, in Twilight Struggle, there's not really hidden information on the board. Here there is, obviously. But, I don't know, just that same kind of kind of feeling I would get from Twilight Struggle, I got from this game to an extent. And I like that, because I love Twilight Struggle. I just thought this was so fun. This back and forth and back and forth. And there's there's this bluff and counter bluff. And then, when you get into the, into the intel tokens, when you're spending intel tokens, and the other guy has you know cards and and like i say you you may see where he's going to attack but you don't know how strong he's going to be or you can see strength cards or bluff cards and you have no idea where the where, where the attack's coming it's it's brilliant it is so much fun these 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 battles there so this game was really drawing me into it i really enjoyed these aspects of the game and yet and yet the game has some issues significant issues um, the first one is, uh, it's fiddly. The end of year housekeeping is a little more involved than it really felt like it should have been. It just, it was just a bit much with, you know, separating the cards and then doing production and then 
the buying some of the cards and it just I don't know it felt like it was that aspect of the game it, it, it again it was a thing where you feel like you're you got such a good pace and you're back and you're fourth and you're doing you're doing and that's okay we got to do this so let's let's consult this again and this and and it just it kind of killed pace for me and you know that's one thing i've really come to appreciate in games is if they can maintain a pace and i understand sometimes you do want to breather and take a take a you know, step back and kind of consider things and i get that but when you're really into a game into a game into a game and then something just just screeches it to a halt and that's what the end of the year stuff in this game did for me it kind of stopped it okay there's that second the rule book sucks rule book I was not a fan of the rule book. Now it's got some, some some good stuff in it, and it's got some of the examples are helpful. Uh, so the examples generally were helpful, but there was um, it, it was I really kind of hard to find certain things I was looking for at times, and just I felt some things weren't adequately explained. And there are a few little tiny things that I think maybe even I ended up playing wrong because I just wasn't one hundred percent sure how I was supposed to interpret stuff from the book. That was very disappointing incredibly disappointing um you know that's kind of the unforgivable sin is um a bad rule book and this one did not have a good rule book not the worst rule book i've ever seen but it was it needed to be better third um and this is the even more unforgivable unforgivable sin early in the game you can pull a move one side can pull a move that can really significantly hamper the other side and put one side pretty much on the defense of the whole game and i think there are probably other ways that that other things that can happen there too and any game that can cripple someone so severely so early that you just there's just no way to recover from i'm not a fan of and that is disappointing and it's happened more than once for me so I just, that is disappointing as well. I liked so much about this game. It got so much right. And yet, it really fumbled the ball in some of these key areas. What I would like to see, and I think if memory serves, I've even heard rumors that there might be kind of a second edition of this game. Maybe I'm making that up or something. But I thought I heard that before I'd even played it, they were talking about doing a second ed edition or something. And, that, and it needs it. I think this needs to be a little bit more streamlined. Better rulebook, a little more streamlined, a little, little more balanced. And I think this game would just be phenomenal. Because so much of this game is good. Recommendation for this game is... Um, you know, with, with, with some of these things I'm saying, I, I just have a hard time even saying try it before you buy it, as is. Um, so I'm going to say probably leave this one alone. I'm not going to give a recommendation review on this one as it is because to me some of those negatives are just a little too much to get over. Um, thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on BoardGameGeek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer, and now I'm going to adjust my hat from board game reviewer hat to literary critic angle. I have to tell you, I was less than impressed with Timothy Zahn's Star Wars Thrawn. I was really looking forward to this book as I loved the Heir to the Empire novels, which I read in high school, but this one just did not cut it for me. I was very disappointed. However, I did rather enjoy uh, James Lucino's Catalyst, which is the prequel to Rogue One. This one I thoroughly enjoyed. So that's it for um, The Discriminating Reader. Somebody help me on my feet again And I don't know where I'm